and welcome back to Using the Debugger. In this lesson, we're going to look at how we can use the Eclipse Java Debugger to gain a better understanding of Java. First, we'll learn how to configure Eclipse to debug the Java system classes. This will allow us to see the actual Java system code in action. Then we'll look at two things that often confuse new Java programmers, object references and the object equals method. In the introducing persistence tutorial, we learned how to attach the Java source code. This lets us see how the creators of Java write Java code. With the Eclipse debugger, we can debug into the system classes and actually see how the Java system code works inside a running program. To do this, we need to have downloaded the JDK 6 package from the Sun Developer Network website. You can see instructions for this in the tutorial companion document. If you haven't already done this, you can pause the tutorial and download the JDK now. Included in this download is a special version of the Java Runtime Engine, or JRE. With Java 6 on Windows, this is located in a directory called Program Files Java JDK 1.6.0 JRE. Note that the Java versions can be referred to either as 5 and 6 or 1.5 and 1.6. To provide maximum runtime performance, the normal JRE is compiled without any debug information. This makes Java programs run faster, but does not allow debugging into Java system methods. The special JRE version that ships with the JDK includes debug information, so we can debug right into Java system classes like ArrayList and String. By default, Eclipse uses the normal JRE, so we need to configure Eclipse to use the special JRE. Here we have Eclipse open. We'll select Window, Preferences, Java, Installed JREs, and we can see we have our standard JRE installed. We'll press Add. We need to give it a name. We'll call it Debug JRE. And then we'll browse to the home directory, which on my Windows system is Program Files Java JDK 1.6.0 JRE. Press OK. And we can see that now we have all of these JAR files. For example, the RT.JAR has a lot of the runtime classes in it. And if we expand, we see that we have the attached source and the Java docs. And we have this decoration that indicates that there's source attached as well. Press OK. We'll keep the standard JRE as the default for new projects. Press OK again. Next, we'll add the debug JRE to the project. We'll open up the project, select it, we'll say Project Properties, Java Build Path. Select the Libraries tab, and we'll select Add Library, JRE System Library, press Next, and we'll select Alternate JRE, and it defaults to the Debug JRE. We'll press Finish, and now we'll remove the standard JRE so that Eclipse will only use the debug JRE. So we'll click on the standard JRE, select Remove, and say OK. And now when we look at our project, we see it says Debug JRE. And behind the scenes, although we didn't see it, Eclipse rebuilt our project using the new JRE. Now let's give it a try. We'll open the My Library class. We'll go Run, Open Debug Dialog, 
We'll make sure we've got My Library selected under Java Application. And we'll make sure we've got Stop in Main selected. And then press Debug. This opens up our debug perspective and we're stopped at line 161. Now, let's go down to line 172. We'll do Control-Alt and then step into the method AddBook. This takes us to the AddBook method where we're calling the Add method of the Java ArrayList class. So now let's press Control-Alt and step into that method. And notice now we're at line 351 of the ArrayList class. So we're debugging right into one of the Java system classes. Now debugging compiled classes like this is a little different than debugging our own source code. If we open the variables view, we don't see automatically the names and values of all the local variables. We can see the values of fields, like element data, if we hover or if we use watch expressions, but we can't see the values of local variables inside these methods. Also, remember that earlier in Lesson 2, we added a step filter to filter our classes starting with the word Java. For example, if we go up here and right click and say Edit Step Filters, remember we added this line here so we wouldn't stop at Java classes. So if we want to use the step commands, we, could, we would have to disable this Use Step Filters and then now we can step into a method step over, step return, and so forth. If we have our step filters on and we try to step, we'll step right back out of the Java classes. So by using this special JRE in Eclipse, we can debug right into the Java system classes. Next, let's use a debugger to look at object references and the string equals method. Let's open the person test class for editing. And we have a method called test object reference that we're going to use to illustrate the difference between primitive types stored on the stack and objects stored on the heap. We'll put a breakpoint in at the first line here. Then we'll right click and debug as JUnit test. And this takes us to our first line. Now, if we step over, we can see we've assigned A the value of 3. We've assigned B the value of A, so now they're both 3. And when we step over line 43, we change the value of A to 4, but B, because it's a primitive type, stored on the stack is unaffected. It's still 3. And that's pretty much what we expect. Now this contrasts with object references as shown in the next set of lines. So here we're creating a new person P1 and setting their name to William Shakespeare. Then in line 47 we step over and we set P2 equal to P1. Now it's important to understand we didn't create a new person object. We just set P2 to the same value that P1 has. Now let's make our variables view a little bigger so we can see this. Now watch what happens when we execute line 48, where we're setting the name of P2 to Charles Dickens, both of these objects, P1 and P2, change to Charles Dickens. And this is because they're really referring to the exact same object. But with the debugger, we can see this visually. 
Now, the last set of lines illustrates the importance of using the equals method when comparing strings. First, we'll, let's, we'll comment out this failing JUnit method, otherwise the debugger won't let us get past this. And we'll save and let's say restart. Since we've changed the thing, we'll restart our debug. And then let's go down to line, click on line 52, use control R to run to line. Now strings in Java are objects, but it's sometimes easy to forget this. And since they are objects, we need to use the objects equals method when we compare them. Now let's step through lines 52 and 53. So we've set both strings to the same literal. And then let's highlight this expression s1 equals s2 and use control shift D to display it and we can see that it's true. So this would make it look like we can use the double equal sign to compare strings and be okay. But the only reason that that works in line 54 is because the Java compiler is able to figure out that these two string literals are identical, so it reuses the same string object to assign to S1 and S2. Next, let's step through lines 55 and 56. And we can see that both strings still have the same value, but because we use this substring, the compiler doesn't know that they're the same value, so it's created different objects. So now let's evaluate S1 double equals S2 using control shift D. And we see this time it evaluates defaults even though the strings have the identical value. And now let's look at S1 dot equals S2, control shift D, and we see that this is true. So to be safe, we always want to use the equals method of strings to check for equality. And the debugger helps us to understand this by seeing the code in action. In this lesson, we've seen two ways to use the debugger to learn more about Java. In the next lesson, we'll use the debugger to look at how a recursive method works. This is the end of Lesson 6. I'm Mark Dexter saying so long for now.